Um, hi, I'm Kevin Rogers and uh, I'm the Director of Reasonable Faith Adelaide. And tonight we have Joshua Mead, who's going to speak on the origin of life. And so now I'll hand it over to Joshua. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, as Kevin said, I'm Joshua and I'm um, going to do a talk on the uh, study that I've done into the origin of life. Uh, so uh, to give uh, some contents, um, I'll begin with just the background uh, into the, uh, the context of, of uh, why I'm doing my talk. I'll give a brief overview of uh, abiogenesis and, um, and then I'll cover just some common terminology and concepts um, just um, uh, that will help for the rest of the talk. Um, following that, I'll go over some of the um, key ingredients for life. Um, uh, the ones I'll cover are new, nucleic acids, uh, followed by proteins or um, polypeptides. Uh, and then finally, I'll um, go over uh, lipids and what they uh, mean for the cell as well. Uh, finally, I'll go over um, chiral resolution, which is uh, which I'll explain later. Okay, and then uh, we can finish up with some discussion and um, some questions. Okay, so let's stop. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so the topic context, uh, the discussion um, around abiogenesis has uh, huge implications in apologetics. The reason I have prepared this talk are as follows. Um, I believe we should strive to understand other worldviews and why people hold them. Um, I think to hold a position on origins, we should have a reasonable insight into the evidences both supporting and opposing our belief. Uh, my goal of this presentation is to set the stage for reasonable discussion on the area of origins. From the research I have conducted, such debates can get unnecessarily heated, <laughs> which is unhelpful, I find. Um, Although I'm very skeptical of the abiogenesis concept, I aim to present the current arguments for and against the theory in a fair manner. And, and finally, I'm definitely not a professional in this field. Uh, rather, I'm merely interested in the science um, and the, the topic of um, conversation. So I, I do apologize in advance if um, any of my research is incomplete or with error. Uh, so a brief a overview of abiogenesis. So abiogenesis is a theory um, in the chemical evolution of life on Earth, whereby organic molecules and subsequent uh, simple life forms first uh, or, uh, oriented or originated sorry, uh, from inorganic substances. So the study of abiogenesis aims to determine how pre-life chemicals um, could have given rise rise to life under conditions strikingly different from those on Earth today. Uh, it primarily uses tools from biology and chemistry. And so uh, any successful theory of abiogenesis must explain the origins and interactions of these uh, molecules and many approaches to abiogenesis uh, investigate how self-replicating uh, self molecules or the components could have come into existence. So generally, uh, the step-by-step -step, um, is as follows. So the, the first step has to be the generation of small, small biomolecules. Um, generally, um, yeah, so we'll go over some of those shortly. Um, polymerization to get um, biopolymers is effectively when these small biomolecules um, join together and perform uh, basically turn into chains of, of polymers which do functions. Now these um, biopolymers need to uh, assemble into organized structures <clears throat> and then um, and then finally the formation of um, protobionts which is just another word for protocells so effectively a, um, a cell membrane with some simple uh, self-replicating um, structures on the inside. 
So some common terminology and concepts. So uh, the first um, terminology that will be often the use is called an enantiomer. So an, an enantiomer is um, also known as op optical isomer. So they're just basically molecules that can be arranged in such a way that they are mirror images of each other. So um, as you can see on the right here, there's um, a carbon atom with a um, tetrahedral shape and it can be arranged in slightly different ways so that um, they become a mirror image of each other. <clears throat> um, many biological molecules are enantiomers. There is um, sometimes a, um, a, a marked difference between the effects of the two enantiomers and biological organisms. So the way these, so the structure um, has a very different um, uh, result if uh, they are switched for some reason or if the wrong one is made. So here you can see, so the way they are called is L form and D form, depending on um, uh, which way they're arranged. And it actually, um, I, th I think they can tell based on how the way that what they do to sort of polarize light. I think it um, reflects light in different ways, which is interesting. Um, so uh, an intimus, um that oh, so molecules that can exist as enantiomers are uh, said to be chiral, which means that they have sort of like a left handedness or a right handedness or L form or D form. Homochirality is when we have 100% uh, what they call enantiomeric excess. Um, so you've either got entirely uh, L form or entirely D form. Um, yeah. So separation of enantiomers is a non-trivial task as they have identical mounting point, boiling point, and solubility. Um, so, so um, yeah, so um, so secondly, there is what they call a diastereomer, which is an awful word to pronounce. Um, they are isomers, isomer configurations similar to that of an enantiomer. Except they do not superimpose on top of the mirror image. So um, you find this when you have, uh, like in the example on the right here, we've got um, a, just one central carbon atom. But if you had a, um, a few central atoms that are connected together, then, um, then you can have it that the mirror image does not actually quite superimpose on itself. Um, and so the um, they're the same compounds still, um, but the, the mirror image does not superimpose. Yeah. It's probably poorly explained, but that's the general idea. <clears throat> so uh, the resolution of enantiomers and uh, the diastromers. So when I say the resolution, I mean um, basically purifying uh, to to um, to take the left handedness and the right handedness and, and separate them. So in antimers, there are some um, processes by which you can do this. So chiral uh, chromatography, um, which is um, where you basically pull it through a gel, um, and depending on the molecule they can travel further or less depending on um, well sort of how you're pulling them through the gel. There's also um, you can uh, deastromeric salt formation so that is when you actually mix it with a um, an, another agent um, and that actually creates from the enantiomers it actually creates um, deastromers from it and then the diastromers can be separated. Uh, and selective crystallization is actually a similar process. Um, you crystallize it, and then the crystallized forms are actually um, uh, more of one than the other. Um, and then going across to the diastromers, they, are, um, they have different physical properties, so they've got different solubility or a different mounting point, so they can actually be separated quite simply. <clears throat> okay, so 
onto the ingredients for life. Um, uh, I'll just do this. No, don't mean that, sorry. Just trying to sort my slide out of the gaps today. Uh, so the first we have is nucleic acids, which is um, DNA and RNA. So that's our information carrying um, molecules. We also have proteins in the human body, well, you know, in the, in the, in the living cell, I should say, um, which is just a, a name, well, it's a name for a polypeptide um, within a living organism. And then we also have lipids, which are involved with um, membranes within the cell, with cell membrane and also membrane within the cell as well. Now, there's also, uh, I've got a note down the bottom here, there are also carbohydrates, which I, I don't cover in this talk, but that's, that's considered sort of a fourth um, key ingredient. So starting with the nucleic acids. Um, so nuclei, nucleic acids, uh, DNA and RNA, are a string of nucleotides and are involved in the storage of genetic information in the nucleus of the cell. And actually, it's not always just the nucleus of the cell, as I've already um, stated in a previous talk, but generally speaking, it's in the nucleus of um, a eukaryotic cell. Nucleotides are composed of a phosphate group and a um, nitrogenous base, which are attached to a pentose sugar. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my um, cursor being. Um, so this here is a DNA structure here. Um, in order to make nucleotides and therefore DNA and RNA, one first has to make the ribose. Ribose is a pentose sugar that has three possible stereogenic centers leading to eight possible isomers, a mix of enantiomers and diastereomers. Uh, oh, that word. <laughs> um, so um, the mix of uh, these are basically um, problematic within the DNA, so they um, have to be made carefully. Um, addressing the polymerization of nucleotides. So <coughs> autocatalytic and self-reproductive uh, molecule, ugh, molecular species are vital to origins based on abiogenesis. So producing specific nucleotide chains in the lab requires a fairly extensive process known as uh, oligocycle. Um, the way that works is that it, it effectively blocks the unwanted but available bond sites um, each step of the way so that the correct bonds, um, bond configurations can be achieved. So it's quite a, quite a drawn out process. Um, uh, that being said, um, well, sort of according to um, some research, uh, RNA monomers or ribonucleotide monomers um, have been shown to uh, polymerize to produce RNA on this, you know, sort of probably messy RNA, but um, RNA nonetheless on the surface of hot clay. So hot clay seems to have properties which promote um, RNA coming together. I should also, uh, I think I must state it later on. So, so that's actually a, um, oh no, no, that's better actually, sorry. So um, addressing self-replication. So, so um, people, a major hypothesis in abiogenesis is uh, what they call RNA world. Um, so like DNA, RNA can store and replicate genetic information. Like protein enzymes, RNA enzymes, which are also known as ribozymes, can catalyze um, so they can start or accelerate chemical reactions that are critical for life. Um, RNA also has been found to have the ability to self-replicate um, or synthesize other RNA molecules. Uh, relatively short RNA molecules that can synthesize other, uh, what well, others have been produced in the lab, the shortest was 165 bases long, so 165 base pairs. So, um, so 
basically the reason why they they believe that RNA would have had to have been a precursor to DNA is just because it, it seems to do all the jobs basically of what DNA can do um, but it does it without having to be um, transcri uh, transcribed into proteins it sort of loosely does those jobs by itself um, RNA like polymers have been found encapsulated in uh, membranous compartments sort of effectively like a protocell um, in uh, situations where there's been a drying and a re rehydrated pool around sort of volcanic areas so that's that's one of their their theories and, and that's where that comes from and I've got the paper there in case anyone wants to look that up and and uh, I haven't actually read the paper myself so I, I couldn't critique at all whether my expertise would even give a give that I'm not too sure but um, anyway so uh, so that's nucleic acids so the second um, key ingredient here is proteins or peptides uh, so proteins um, which are polypeptides specific to living or organisms are chains of amino acids that perform various functions in the cell uh, so they are structural components um, they are enzymes so an example there is DNA polymerase and they are messengers so they can be sort of types of hormones um, they can be responsible for transport and storage within the cell and also um, an antibody so they can bind to specific foreign particles there are roughly 500 amino acids that have been identified in nature but just 20 amino acids make up the proteins found in the human body um, 19 of the 20 natural amino acids are homochiral being, uh, being left-handed. So, so there's one there that, that it doesn't matter which way around it goes. <clears throat> so proteins form complex three-dimensional shapes. So there's actually, so they, they sort of break it down into four, uh, four sort of um, stages. There's the, uh, the primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure and the quaternary structure. So the first structure is effectively just a chain of many amino acids linked together by peptide bonds, uh, and that's called the polypeptide. Each amino acid can have a unique attribute. So, so along the chain, each um, yeah, so like say so each each amino acid can that can be hydrophobic, hydrophilic, which is um, uh, whether they are attracted to or opposed to water. They can be positively or negatively charged, so they can have some characteristics. Uh, secondary structure that I don't really understand this uh, too much in detail, but um, they um, basically uh, uh, become helices and beta um, pleated sheets. So I sort of understand how the um, helices, what sort of function they can provide, but um, yeah, I don't know too much into that, unfortunately. Tertiary structures is the final shape of uh, the entire chain. So that will become a 3D shape, which um, is directly related to the function of the protein. And then finally, the um, quaternary shape uh, is when more than one protein strand comes together to form a protein complex. So, um, so that's uh, like would be a typical polypeptide. So as you can see, we've got the amino acid down, that's the large circle, and that sort of says what an amino acid might look like. <clears throat> and then that goes into a, a chain of amino acids, and each in this chain obviously folds and, and um, has particular characteristics. Uh, these amino acids join together by dehydration. So when they join together, they actually lose uh, a water molecule, as you can see. So um, the uh, Miller-Urey experiment, which is a famous experiment in 1952, um, was um, two scientists trying to work out how um, some of these amino acids could have come about um, on, a, say, a prebiotic earth. The process mimicked um, cyclic heating and cooling, as well as energy input in the form of sparks mimicking lightning strikes. So without a 
uh, chiral influence. Uh, for example, chiral catalyst solvent or starting material, a chemical reaction that makes a chiral product will always yield what they call a racemate, which is basically um, a, a, a pure sort of mix of all of the elements. <clears throat> so half would be left-handed and half would be right-handed in, in a simple sort of um, um, isomer. Therefore, the resulting um, compounds were racemic mixtures of both L and D form isomers. Yeah. So therefore, chiral resolution is necessary in order to render the racemic a mixture suitable for polypeptides in the human body. Okay, so, and I'll go over some of those later. So just the, the final um, ingredient here is the lipids. So lipids are molecules that contain hydrocarbons that make up the building blocks of a structure and function of living cells. Examples of lipids include fats, oils, waxes, certain vitamins, uh, hormones and most of the cell membrane um, that is not made up of protein. Lipids are not soluble in water as they are nonpolar, um, but are thus soluble in nonpolar solvents such as chloroform. Lipids naturally form into organized arrangements due to their polar um, characteristics. Uh, so just, just to, to um, if simplify that. So um, the typical diagram that you see is a, sort of a head which is attracted to the water and tails that are opposed to the water. So they, um, if you put them in water in a water mix, they will they will naturally form into these kind of um, cell membrane type um, structures. So that's what the lipid actually looks like. Uh, so you can see the tails here that oppose the water and the heads that are attracted to the water. <clears throat> so, um, so the lipids make up the cell membranes, which have a very key role in the cell. So um, they import the necessary molecules like water, nutrients, etc., and they export waste. They maintain the pH and the salinity of the, of the cell. Um, they maintain osmotic pressure. Um, they block the toxins and uh, invaders. It also electrically isolates the cell, so um, uh, which is important for um, harnessing the source of energy that cells use oh, and harnessing the energy that we So one example of, of um, the, how the cell membrane um, looks, for instance, with these proteins is uh, this would be a potassium um, filter, basically, and it would only let potassium come through. So um, a very precise protein is actually embedded within the, uh, the phospholipid bilayer. Um, and uh, the potassium um, uh, atoms would come through and then as you can see here they've got a very selective criteria um, which is effectively a, a complex protein um, that only lets the potassiums come through um, and generally speaking with this they also electrically isolate it so um, even with things such as water coming through they would actually um, they're sophisticated enough to not let that become a conducting, uh, a conducting uh, wire effectively to maintain um, a, a charge gradient. And I've also mentioned, so simply having leaky cells isn't insufficient. So without these proteins, um, you just basically have um, a leaky cell, which is, which is nowadays very inefficient for actually um, having a, a live cell. Okay, so finally, we'll just go over some of the chiral resolution, uh, which we were talking about before. So chiral resolution uh, of biomolecules is achieved readily within the cell. It is thought that this process involves specialized proteins that use the spin of electrons. So they call it um, chiral induced spin selectivity. So um, from all I could gather that 
is a fairly new development well, within the last five to 10 years. Um, and basically proteins that are chiral have, um, are obviously they've got the same um, structure except the mirror images of each other. And so if you have um, an electron um, traveling through this protein, then it actually um, puts a different spit on it. And um, long story short, uh, they believe that's how um, our body can determine whether the uh, isomer is suitable for, uh, say, creating our proteins or uh, amino acids or creating our, um, sort of replicating our DNA and whatnot. Research into prebiotic chiral resolution have demonstrated the following. So these are claims that have been made and not, um, um, yeah, so, so I'd encourage anybody to look into them uh, further. So some amino acids can uh, crystallize in an, an anti-pure fashion. So, so if, um, um, if things are crystallizing, then often they can be in groups of uh, left-handedness or right-handedness. Additionally, um, other amino acids that do crystallize as racemates, so as 50-50 mixes, can um, de-racemize under sublimation. So when they go from, say, like a solid crystal to a gas, they can actually... Um, uh, so they can actually um, apparently produce um, separation of the enantiomers. There's also uh, a, no, I don't actually know how to say it, I've only read it, soy, soy reaction that is autocatalytic. And this leads to rapidly increasing amounts of the same enantiomer of the product. So during the reaction, so alpha, they're supposed to say L form and D form. So they sort of promote their own autocatalysis, autocatalysis, um, and, and they actually inhibit the other. So it's, it's a non -linear, uh, linear system. So um, if you get a slight um, difference in the proportions of left handedness to right handedness, then that um, over time, those concentrations actually become um, further and further one way until you've got basically 100% one way after X amount of time. And finally, mineral, mineral absorb, or absorption. So chiral cal, uh, calcite surfaces are also known to selectively absorb either D or L amino acids. Um, and therefore you can also lead to enriched uh, stereoisomers. So it absorbs one and leaves the other um, to um, sort of purify. So there are just some, some, there are some experiments that have been done by scientists to, to see how they can actually get the separation of these enantiomers. Oh, I did obviously update that final one. Okay, so, um, so here's some final thoughts and questions that I had. Um, often during my research on this topic, um, sort of the, the whole, um, sort of complexity argument was always just met with uh, that's just go out of the gaps. Um, so I've sort of said here is it reasonable or unreasonable when a you know when say an atheist uh, discredit all the sort of intelligent design arguments is simply go out of the gaps. Um, given you know um, some of the complexities involved with the cell. Um, and then I've said, when I study the complexities within the cell, the stepwise gradual process required to go from, say, a protocell, which is really not really living. It's just a, let's say, like a soap bubble with um, a couple of things inside that might be repeating themselves. To go from that to a sophisticated eukaryote cell, uh, we seem today seems in a, insufficient. So I've said, for example, that um, the transition from what they think might be early RNA-based life to a DNA-based life. Uh, that seems like a major step to me. Um, one that um, sort of requires a great deal of thought. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, and then insert any other questions here. Um, but yeah, so that, that's just my final thoughts on that. Uh, I've got some 
like they're just some YouTube resources of um, sort of uh, you know, sort of debates on one way and the other. Um, but you know, yeah, so back to the questions. I guess that's that's my talk done. Um, yeah, so if we can go into a, a discussion, that'd be perfect. Let's get up the grid. All right, I'll let you take over, Kevin. Can't hear you. You did unmute your microphone, but you haven't. But for some reason, I can't hear you still. Try that now. No? Can anyone else hear Kevin? Uh -huh. No. I can hear somebody else. So someone else is working. <clears throat> I can't even hear him. I can't hear him. Is his your microphone? Big, um, oh, there you go. Kevin, huh? your mic off. Yeah, I, I, so, can you hear me now? Oh, there you go. Yeah. All right, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to unmute at the wrong spot. <laughs> right. So, all right, thanks for the presentation, uh, Josh. Um, now, uh, uh, just to go through the chat. Oh, yes. Uh, let's see. Um, Somebody asked a question. Um, uh, what does abiogenesis actually mean? Oh, I thought I had. Uh, you, I well, it doesn't matter whether you thought you mm. had, just explain it again. Yeah, well, I'll just go up to it. Um, yeah, right. Here we go. Um, what does it actually mean? Um, well, a bi I mean, biogenesis is creating oh, life and life. Oh, sorry, I'll interrupt you. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody um, uh, answered the question on the the chat line. Oh, and, so, <laughs> and said medical medical definition of abiogenesis: uh, the origin of life from non living matter, specifically a theory in the evolution of early life on Earth organic molecules and subsequent simple life forms first originated from inorganic substances. So I think it's basically saying um, having a theory to go from inorganic substances to a living cell. Is that, so is that correct? That sounds right to me. All right, okay. Yeah. Uh, da -da, right. Now, there were uh, discussions on the... Uh, Stephen mentioned about the uh, Miller-Urey experiment, but you covered that. And um, Derek Silby made a comment that uh, RNA self-replication could be a cause of cancer. Would you like to comment on that, Derek? Um, well, it's either RNA or DNA. I can't remember which. But when he, oh. when he mentioned it, I, I, did, I did recall that the failure to control cellular multiplication is a primary cause of many cancers. Mm. I think it was DNA. I'm happy to be corrected if you think it's DNA. That that's fine. It's just something I yeah, found. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure um, if RNA naturally self-replicates in our own in our body. I'm not too sure about that. Um, I just know that they've they've they they uh they can create self-replicating RNA. Um, but our RNA from what I understand is, is basically all taken from our DNA, transcribed from our DNA and then right, destroyed. There's a form of RNA called mRNA, which is messenger RNA. Mm. And I wondered if that runs amok, could that, could, could that still that, be? That, that, that's messenger RNA. RNA is what is created from our DNA. Yep. Uh, that, I mean, I've, I've probably got a simplistic understanding of it, but that's my understanding of it anyway. Is that messenger RNA is is taken from our DNA as a, as a basically an exact copy, and then um, transcribed into the proteins. But there there may be complexities there that I don't that I'm unaware of. I'm not a biologist, but my understanding is that RNA RNA is not capable of self replication. Uh. Like I said, I don't believe that the RNA inside our body 
is used for self replication. I mean, RNA inside our body can be used uh, as enzymes, like um, uh, our um, uh, what's an example? Uh, ribosomes in yeah. our body are basically RNA enzymes. So it's an RNA strand, which I understand, yeah, I understand that RNA is what forms viruses, some of which we need. We, we need viruses in our body. Um, but you're right, I think, uh, Ron, that they, they don't replicate as accurately as DNA does. DNA has a very no. self-correction code. Um, and viruses, of course, that's why we've got COVID at the moment, it evolves much more quickly. Yeah, RNA is very unstable. Um, yeah. But I, I, I guess it's... it's um, the reason why they take that line is because um, it, it sort of is, is more, um, well, it, 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 it's multi-purpose in a sense, because, because they can produce RNA that does self-replicate. So that's, that's what they're going on, I, I guess. Josh, are you yeah. saying that the, the yeah. RNA that kind of we have in our body can't self-replicate? But uh, I don't believe other... so. Yeah, but other forms of RNA can. Well, yes. small, smallest, yeah. Yes, yes. So like I said, the, the smallest is, I think, about 100 and, what was it, 165 base pairs. That's the smallest one that they've made so far. They've also made other, other size RNA lengths that can self-replicate as well. Right. Mm. So you're saying they have manufactured RNA that can self-replicate, but there isn't any that's made itself that can self-replicate? That's my understanding. So, yeah. When they say they've made RNA, that means they've kind of modified other RNA. They don't make it from scratch, do they? <laughs> no. Well, that, like I say, they um, there's, um, like I said here, there was, um, da, 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 da. there's processes by which they can do it. So, um, Uh, I've lost it. They can join them together, but when they join them together, they got to be really careful because all these other um, sites here can. Um, uh, where did I put it? Yeah, the uh, oh, that's for that's for nucleic acids. Um, possibly amino acids aren't quite so sensitive. Yeah, I'm not too. I, I don't know if it's a comp uh, complicated system there or not. But definitely for um, for nucleic acids, um, it's very touch and go. Oh, even no, when we come to DNA, even when we come to DNA. That doesn't reproduce by itself, does it? It requires the all the mechanisms of the cell to be able to. Um, yeah, definitely. Replicate. Yeah, so so DNA requires it, it needs to be copied. Um, it needs to yeah, it effectively needs to be split and then um, zipped together with with new polypeptide, uh, yeah, new um, yeah, nu uh, nu nucleic. Basis. So that that needs a special protein to kind of run along the. Yeah. It unzips it, it runs along it, it unzips it, and then it, it basically matches it up as it goes through an unzipping. So it is a sophisticated protein, yeah. Um, DNA, is it polymerase, I think? Does it, uh, so, so, one, so, so one protein, uh, I think it's called DNA helicase, it actually unravels it. Another one comes along and unzips it. And then, and then another one comes along and I think attaches all the base pairs to it as well. It all seems very magic magic to me. These big molecules that are actually uh, machines. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it is. Um, now that's only the start of it. Yeah. Mm. Um, they're always sort of. Yeah, yeah. It, it, like, like it is. It is a chicken and an egg problem, and that's that's why at the end I sort of say, like, because you need obviously the. Um, the DNA to produce these proteins and then you need the proteins to replicate the DNA and to produce um, more proteins from the DNA. So it's it's very sort of chicken and egg problem, um, simply put. All right. Uh, 
Can you bring up your final thoughts uh, slide, please? That's not your final slide. <laughs> uh, I've just got to scroll through them. Here you go. All right. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, do, so, do, do, do you see? All right. Um, um, uh, the stepwise. All right. When I study the complexities within the cell, the stepwise gradual process required to go from protocell to sophisticated eukaryotic um, cell with, uh, seems insufficient. For example, the transition from RNA to DNA-based life. That sounds like a huge understatement. <laughs> yeah. Because um, uh, um, um, I, th I think it's been expressed far more strongly than this, that basically the, um, the more they go into it, uh, the harder it is to explain. <laughs> so the gaps yes. keep on growing. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, um, if you don't mind, could I read John Lennox's book? Because he really hits it. In fact, we're going to quote from Richard Dawkins, because Richard Dawkins himself, you know, the arch um, proponent for uh, evolution, admits himself. May I? Just yes, take you a may. Don't um, give us a uh, whole book, just the quote. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> Dawkins cites Isaac Asimov's estimate of the probability of randomly assembling a hemoglobin molecule from uh, amino acids. And then he goes into some details here. We remind the reader, this is John Lennox, of Dawkins' unequivocal conclusion. It is grindingly, creakingly, crashingly obvious that if Darwinism was really a theory of chance, it wouldn't work. You don't need to be a mathematician or a physicist to calculate that an eye or a hemoglobin molecule would take from here to infinity to self-assemble to self-assemble by sheer higgledy piggledy luck. I never thought I'd be quoting Richard Dawkins, but I'm quite happy to quote him at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I think basically what what uh, would be said about that, well, in my opinion, is that it it wouldn't have just been something like hemoglobin to start with. They would say it was it obviously had to start with more simple structures that that gradually built up, but that's insufficient in my mind mm. like i say like um uh, uh, yeah well it, josh yeah. Can, josh can you uh, summarize the major problems with um um what uh what are the issues that kind of uh, lead you to make that statement well okay um well, it's it's kind of like the irreducible complexity sort of, you know, like when you have DNA, you have proteins that are very specific to, like I said, unraveling the DNA um, um, and copying the DNA, um, et cetera. So there's very specific, you know, very specific tasks. Um, and to... I, I can't see how going from RNA to DNA could be a gradual process. It would it would have to be functioning with the, the RNA and just have these other mutations within the um it would have to have DNA which isn't being sort of expressed and then over time it just happens to fall into the right sort of uh you know enough changes in this DNA molecule that it can actually start expressing some um, some proteins of it. It, it just it seems ins insufficient because in a sense oh. it, it's too too completely what if different. Early DNA system. was just formed by two RNA snapping together. And um, well, it's that that, that might be that. true, uh, but um, uh, I think what Josh was saying that um, he sort of. Um, irreducible complexity it meant basically all the components have to be there at once to act for the system to work and Before there's no can, yeah. uh, and you're saying that there was no stepwise process to actually get there is well, that what that, you're that's, saying that's my understanding yeah that's that, that that's 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 my understanding 
And, and I think look, that's a lot my, of people's understanding. And may I say, if I may, John Lennox, remember, is a professor of math- mathematics at um, Oxford University. Mm. I guess there's people who are in the logical side of science, um, the sheer probability of these things assembling themselves, even by chance, would take trillions and trillions of years. And that's, I guess, the main point that a, a mathematician, uh, may I say, probably one of the most preeminent malati- ma- mathematicians in the world made. And of course, he came and spoke at Adelaide, like, what was about five or six years ago? We, we heard him, didn't we? Um, Kevin, you, did you, you went to that, didn't you? No. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, it was Adelaide University. <laughs> on yeah, no, I, I, I did. Yes. Yeah. Did. <clears throat> yeah. It, it's a sheer probability. So look, for those of us who live, I guess, in a world where mathematics rules, the chances of this happening, and look, even Richard Dawkins admits it too. Um, in fact, what he, he goes, and John Lewis is very good at quoting, he actually proposes, that, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the analogy of monkeys typing out, if you give them enough time, and it was Huxley who put it together, type, give them enough time, randomly putting on, um, typing in a typewriter, they'd come up with one of um, Shakespeare's sonnets and, okay, great, look, it can happen by accident. But he admits that to get to an RNA or DNA, you must have a chief monkey saying that when they get to one target letter, they'll stop and then go on with something else. There has to be some master monkey guiding them all so they put it all together at the right time. Because if it's completely random, you're going to take trillions of years before you get there. Uh, I've, actually had the analogy, that. I've had the analogy before, but it was with the script of Hamlet. Okay, yes, yeah, Shakespeare anyway, it was Shakespeare, yeah. Former, yes, Chief, no, atheist, no. former Chief Atheist Anthony Flew uh, was convinced of the incorrectness of atheism when he went through this uh, monkeys and sonnets business. And um, basically, uh, monkeys the size of um, atoms uh, filling up the size of the known universe for the duration of the perceived duration of the universe uh, <laughs> ran- randomly Sorry. typing a character every well, every fraction of a second um, would still not produce a complete sonnet in that time uh, so just a basic sonnet from that is not happening so therefore DNA RNA is even less likely yeah and Tom I think Tom had something to say about that no I was just <laughs> Brian caught himself there. Good catch. Good catch. On the perceived on the perceived age of the universe for the monkeys yep. typing. Um, <laughs> well, the time that is given by the likes of Dawkins and others for the age of the universe, given that amount of time and the perceived size, it still mm. wouldn't happen. Yeah. What is William Lane Craig said? There are three, and I haven't heard of another one. It's either necessity, uh, chance, or design. Um, and I think that can be applied to uh, the origin of life as well. But one thing one thing to ask you, it's very clear, right, uh, Josh, that we're talking about the origin of life here. There's, there's nothing here that, that casts any doubt or any comment at all on the theory of evolution at all, right? We're talking about prior to evolution here right yeah chemi- chem- like yeah chemical evolution basically yeah evolution yeah. officially starts when a life begins according to the theory uh, prior to yeah, that by, it's not by, evolution by, it's just uh, chemical reactions yeah yeah this is all just this is all just um um looking into the yeah the um, the likelihood or the unlikelihood that yeah chemical processes can bring about uh, replicating systems that sure but i just thought it'd be useful to clarify that yeah 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 no thank you yeah yeah that is the case yeah um i would i i'd actually be not surprised if um uh we it did happen uh, going from um uh inorganic matter to the first cell by natural processes but um uh and it is. I, I think it is possible that one day they might be able to provide a description of how it happened, but that doesn't mean that it's not designed. Uh, for instance, if you actually, um, uh, if you could easily create a complete explanation of how a car is produced, 
but that doesn't mean it was came into being by chance. <laughs> um, yes. it was obviously, a, 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 a car is designed. So just because you can actually explain by, uh, the, what happened doesn't mean it happened by chance. It um, uh, can still... Well, obviously, it can ha happen by design. That's how most things uh, com complex we see are built. So I think there's kind of a, a thought process that goes uh, on in scientific communities. So um, if you can explain how it happened, therefore, it was not designed. But I don't, don't think that's a valid argument at all. In this case, I can't even explain how it could possibly have happened, and let alone how it did happen. Yeah, well, they're still struggling with that, and there's uh, huge hurdles to that. But um, um, all right, maybe they one way will. So I think we should actually be uh, careful uh, uh, to say, "Oh, it must be a miracle," and it didn't happen by uh, um, natural processes, because um, mm, I think you you could. Uh, Stumble you can get yourself stuck into a corner doing that. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah. You could be doing a guide of the gaps once again, right? Um, yeah. And, yeah. and in fact, that would be um, what we've come to learn, and, and what the reasonable faith guys have, have, have educated us on. Uh, uh, sorry, the reasons to believe guys have educated on with um, Biologus's point. Um, uh, but anybody at Biologus um, leadership. If we found out um, a completely naturalistic solution to abiogenesis, that wouldn't affect their faith whatsoever because they say, well, yeah, more than more than likely we can find a naturalistic cause because that's what that's what God used. Yeah, I found I'm sorry. I found slide 30 very speculative about how they were going to filter the left and the right hand or the L's and the D's and oh yeah, you can get the chart. That's right. How you can get back to uh, that yes we've now speculating that it might happen but uh for all that from a, i guess straight mathematical point of view um mm. it, i think however many what the minimum number i look admittedly it goes back quite a few years now and probably precedes the five years that now tried to work out how the coral um filtering will happen but i believe i've read somewhere that there are 40 amino acids in the simplest protein. I, I could stand corrected there. but I think I think we only have 20 amino acids to choose 20, from. Okay, but it's like uh, tossing a left and a right hand. Uh, if you'd have to have them all there, of, the diff, of those particular uh, amino acids that go to make that particular, okay, if we're talking about 20, that mm. particular protein would have to be all there at the same time, all left hand only except for i think one exception you mentioned and assembled yeah. right at that moment if that particular protein was done and then every other protein would have to have the same chance and you are now talking impossible odds i'm i'm, I'm proposing you really would have impossible odds way out there yeah well, i mean i suppose um people that advocate for abiogenesis wouldn't necessarily agree with you um, I'm not saying that I don't agree with you. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think basically they would agree with him in a sense. That the, but the point is, we are here, and we do not like the alternative yeah. explanations. Therefore, that is what happened. Yes, and then it, so here, so so, uh, like I said here, roughly 500 amino acids have been identified in nature. So uh, 20 amino acids make up the proteins found in the human body, yeah. uh, and 19 out of those 20 um, are homophile. Yeah. I, I left it. So, so what um, that sort of supports your what you just said, Stephen, because um, yeah. if there's 500 uh, amino acids that maybe could come about in nature via yes. natural means, uh, we need to select a combination of just 20 of those amino acids. And all of those have to, well, all, all but mm. one, a 19 out of 20 have to be left handed. Yeah, so I suppose I suppose like um, that's sort of why I went over some of these ways that that left-handed and right-handed can actually be um, uh, isolated, you know, or separated. Um, because, uh, like I said, I, I want to provide reasons uh, for oh, yes. each side, and so oh, I, no, I, think, I, I think it's important to. Um, but, but in the so-called soup that the primordial soup. 
Uh, yeah. How are you going to separate them? Surely uh, with the ebb and flow of um, liquid water, I presume that's the, the solution in which it was done. Certainly that's the miller Urey experiment was done in, uh, mm. you know, get, or sorry, not in liquid, it was done in liquid. Yes. There's mixing happening all the time. How can yeah, you... Yes, yes, that's, that's, what, they, that's, that that's what they're talking about. That's just what they're talking right about. At any particular moment when there's always fluctuation. Hmm. That, that's what they talk about, like, put like small pools where they've got little sort of isolated networks and whatnot. So well, that, the that, other that, thing about the other thing about the Miller-Urey experiment, it had to, they had to specifically isolate it because it was a um, it was a reversible chemical reaction. If you discharge into this organic compound, just as many amino acids would be destroyed as mm. those being formed. Because it is a reversible, you know, the charge of uh, static electricity yeah. will just as easily destroy an amino acid as it would create it. Yeah. So there, there I, are a I lot, did, of, did, there are a lot of conditions placed before you could even start getting amino acids. And yeah. Then... So that, that's that's where they um, sort of went, uh, well, I suppose based on what you just said, that's that's why the um, the lipids were such an important fe uh, yeah. feature because yeah. they they effectively protect whatever they're trying to yeah. chemically evolve inside the little bubbles so um to me it's a stretch like i say i i but um i just try to give the evidences where they believe they are so yeah and look as i say i'll just uh, quote uh, richard dawkins if i need to about um even he acknowledges mm. the sheer probability of this just happening by a series of accidents mm. Yeah. He's good for quotes, Richard Dawkins. <laughs> uh, and in particular, I, I, I really appreciate John Lennox because um, he not just pushes his own view, he goes and selectively well, finds out the number of times that yeah, evolutionists and others have actually admitted um, earlier in the book that they cannot and will not accept anything other than a natural solution. What that's, book is that exactly? That they will not deviate from. Sorry, we, we you said slide 30 is a, a, a big leap. Uh, I wasn't necessarily trying to um, make that leap. No, no, I'm sorry, I, and maybe I'm digressing. I apologise if I yeah. have, but I'm just yeah. saying there is, uh, what's the right word? Um, God of the gaps applies, well, if I may say, equally in their sense too, um, atheist oh, of the gaps. I completely so agree. It applies much more strongly, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but um, uh, you often hear, we currently know, uh, don't know, but some day we'll find out. Hmm. And so you can cover anything with that. <laughs> yes. Yep. So um, so they have this faith that they'll ultimately uh, uh, find an explanation. And so um, there's, uh, uh, that covers everything. It answers anything, and so it answers nothing. Do you want to read Peter's comments? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Or oh, you can read it. I can read it. Okay, uh, so from Peter, the other important basic ingredient for life are essential trace elements involved in protein structure and function. Uh, for example, iron and hemoglobin, enzyme function in uh, metabolism, cell signaling, etc. If these are um, deficient or excessive, they are detrimental to life, a delicate balance. He also said, I think the ingredients are just chemicals. The focus should be on the in, uh, intertwined three cell core process, structural integrity, e.g. membranes, metabolism from energy and genes, proteins, uh, so, it's, yeah. so proteins essential for membrane function, um, like transporter proteins, switching genes on and off, etc. Hence, the simplest cell needs all three processes to work simultaneously. To date, there is no mechanism to explain how one uh, on the three leads to the other, or vice versa. Yep. Uh, Peter, are you able to talk to that? Yeah, yeah. happy to. Thanks, Chris. Uh, um, I guess my point is, I mean, we forget sometimes these elements uh, as part of your lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And I just wanted just to highlight that they're very important, even in, in the most basic cell. Uh, in terms of um, making proteins functional. I mean, you know, the protein isn't just the endpoint. It's other elements. These key elements can make a big difference. Red blood cell is a good example. Um, I, I think the other, I mean, you can take 
the mathematical view that John Lennox, you know, the improbability of all this happening. But I think the other guy I've been listening to lately, you may have heard of James Tour. He's a, a chemist, um, uh, and uh, basically his, his his view is, yeah, you can concoct anything you like in the lab, but the um, precision needed in 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 a, in a controlled environment with intelligent chemists at, at the helm um, struggle to even get the most basic things done. And I think you've got a link there. Thanks uh, for that, Josh. Um, so, so really, to me, this is the Achilles heel, and 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 there's just no explanation really of how even the basic chemistry, chemical evolution, let alone getting into the most simplest cell uh, structure. I, I always sometimes quote um, Niels Bohr, who once said, "If you haven't understood, if you're not shocked by quantum mechanics, you haven't understood it." And I really think a lot of these atheists. Uh, have not been shocked yet because they really haven't understood the complexity and intertwined complexity um, of cell, basic cell structure function. It, it, it's, when you look at it, it you know, it's just poor inspiring. A lot of my biochemist friends um, actually come to the conclusion. We have, I have no idea how, the, I, I, I love how it all works. I don't care about how it all happened. <laughs> um, and, and they just acknowledge this, the complexity is just, mind-boggling and mm. um but prefer to just not worry about it uh, and just you know focus on the on what's the here and now anyway i'll stop there i specifically no. didn't go really much and I, I i dabbled in a, a little bit with um say the potassium the, the protein that was sort of passing through the potassium um and, and i and also with the um uh, the spin related um uh, what was it called um uh, bu -bu 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 -bum. yeah it's been using the spin of the electrons to actually um resolve these enantiomers so i I, yeah, yeah. I tried to brief on a couple of the complexities of the cell but i i didn't want to necessarily dive into that because that's not really where i well <laughs> It, it it gets very complicated very quick and and I, and it's it maybe um something for another talk um uh because there is there is a lot there is a lot there that i could have tried to cover but um it wasn't where i was trying to necessarily go i was, I was more just trying to talk about maybe how some of the key ingredients could have come into existence um and whether they seem reasonable or not so going from the basic sort of um proto cell to the complexities of a an actual living cell um is is, is kind of a a topic for an, another discussion in a sense it's fine to be talked about obviously but um i didn't dive into that specifically because it's a very deep pool to dive into um, and I could have got lost in just looking at all the complexities of um, cell organelles. So that would need a need a, uh, a whole presentation it in and of itself. You've done a great job, though. I mean, of course, one of the um, one of the theories that isn't dead yet is and this has gotten a new lease of life with the james webb space telescope is that life came to earth like the first self-replicating uh, molecules came to earth from uh from elsewhere various issues with that panspermia thank you that's the yeah, word yeah. i was looking for so it's How would it's it got be a lot of problems then? yeah that, that space odyssey 2001 isn't it tom it, it, it's still well. I think it's getting. He was one of the wide. people who invented it. Yes, Asimov. Yeah, you're right. Asimov. No, How did uh, it originate Clark. elsewhere then? Arthur C. Clarke and Grammar Singer were the two people oh, came God. up with. Oh, Arthur C. Clarke. Sorry, yeah. It moves the problem. <laughs> uh, can you comment it, on? It does. Uh, can you comment on Eliza's question? Sorry. Would you like to repeat your question, uh, Eliza? How would it? How would it have originated elsewhere then? Oh, it's the same problem, but the time span is vastly different. If you think that the universe is, you know, thirteen point seven something billion years old, 
rather than four million years old, right? So, so it's 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 it just basically extends the time frame by an enormous amount, but it probably doesn't yeah. change the mechanics. More to the point, it moves the problem to where we can't see it, so therefore we don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, uh, I I think um, from what I read, they um, yeah, or, or came across they they believe this is been given you sort of credence because I think they find when they look at the light from some of these asteroids that they can detect um, um, basically uh, all the sort of the building block well not all of them but you know various um, alien TV programs to be precise. amino acids and whatnot so I'm not too sure I mean that's they must look at I suppose the light that comes off them and analyze it it has a lot of problems because of cosmic uh, um, radiation and stuff radiation. like that to be able to get through, to be able to get molecules that can actually live. There's a couple of candidates when I was last looking at this, but then they seem to have been eliminated as well. So, but as I said, I think James Webb, because it's looking for water and carbon dioxide and all other things in much deeper space is, is actually creating a new buzz whether there's any more substance, but there's a lot more buzz uh, around the topic. Mm. Yeah, I can't imagine the entry into Earth's atmosphere would be overly good for them either. Be spectacular. Mm. Warm ride. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Any other sort of thoughts? I'd like to just uh, comment on Kevin's point earlier about uh, the non-organic becoming organic. Uh, if we take Genesis description, at the start we have inorganic, which is the dust of the earth, all the chemistry that's involved in the earth coming together into a mould, forming a physical shape and body. Uh, i.e. Adam, but the thing to bring the life was the action of God breathing on that inorganic and radically changing the whole chemistry system and processes. So I don't see a problem in the transition from dust mould into a living being being a special uh, work of the Holy Spirit and therefore man's made in the image of God is not a problem, it's the whole crux of the starting point of who's the architect of the universe, who's directing the process, hmm. what's the result, and it's all there. It's all very logical, but you need all the elements coming together in the right time frame, and, uh, you know, that's uh, my comment. I did have another question of Josh, and that was uh, many years ago, back in the 50s, there was a, an article put out by someone talking about the chemistry of the body, and he came to a conclusion that when you look at the chemistry, it's worth about $5 in the money of that day uh, as the value of the human body, that we're just a bag of chemicals worth about mm. five bucks. But then uh, read, when I read an article a bit later in the 70s, I think, someone did a more accurate analysis and came to a conclusion we could get to a million dollars for for the human body because there's a lot more chemicals in there that are actually quite valuable for all the functions. So my question is, has anyone done an update on how you put a, a value on the incredible chemistry that's uh, becoming more and more obvious with what you're being describing to us? Are we many well, millions more? All of the stuff that I described tonight is is probably wouldn't add much value i wouldn't think of that just hydrocarbons really um yeah so um i'm not I, I mean i don't know i don't know where the valuable minerals would be uh in the the, the body but um uh from what i understand the, the basic... brain for example sorry the question what value would you put on certain chemicals that are essential in, say, our brain and uh, nervous system and so forth? Is there any 
one coming up with an idea that we're actually very valuable bags of chemicals. <laughs> I haven't heard. I haven't heard that one. No. Well, hey, Trevor, what what chemicals are you talking about that are so valuable? Uh, well, the comment is how you actually would manufacture some of the chemistry that's in, for example, the brain, uh, even though it might be small amounts. It's actually what processes do you have to do to actually refine it, make it, and produce it. All right. That's the point that was in the article. Uh, yes. All right. it more complicated and more amazingly made than just this simple bag of cells that was there back in the 50s because we didn't understand a lot of the processes. Mm. I think that was the point. Oh, you know, yeah. I, th I think I think you're, well, I think from what I understand, um, a lot of the stuff actually can't be made at the moment, even in the lab. Uh, a lot of the, um, like you can, you can make it from pre-existing like you can make, say, DNA, you can splice DNA together and whatnot from using using proteins to splice them. So you can actually splice DNA and whatnot at particular sites using proteins and using stuff that's pre-existing. But if you want to do that for all by yourself, it's a very, um, well, I, I, I don't know if there are actual processes that can actually do it. But you, most of the time they're using pre-existing stuff. Mm. Uh, you can um, you can you can make amino acids with uh, as in the um, uh, 1953 experiment. Yeah, but they were just um, that they weren't sort of synthesizing. Um, they they didn't say I want to make this one and this one and this one and I want to join them up together specifically. It, it, it's um, yeah, they made they made bare amino acid. Uh, molecules yes. um, but yeah they can't string them together you can you make a any can they make any protein from scratch or do they have to use a, a, or they're just modifying existing proteins um i've got it i've got it here that's that's called um polymerization so so it's a dehydration reaction so when you're connecting the amino acids together um so they can do that yeah so yeah not um yeah i don't think that's i don't think that's terribly difficult it, it comes down to you need to get your own dust yeah. Everybody knows that joke. yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i was thinking about that one earlier yeah but but even if you uh, don't get if even though you borrow the dust, uh, you can make uh, chemicals. But like you, um, and you can join the chemicals together, but you can't actually make something like a protein, which is a factory, which does something. Because uh, pro uh, no amino acid chains are proteins. Amino acid chains. All right, so you can make an amino acid chain. Mm. And so that is a, a, a protein, is it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, like, can they make uh, a protein? A protein is so a polypeptide is based. Well, a protein is basically just a polypeptide, um, which is used inside sort of the human, like used inside cells, living organisms. When you say polypeptide, so poly that... just means multiple peptides, and these and, are amino acids of peptides. An amino acid is a peptide. Yeah. Right. The so peptide bonds hold amino acids together. Yeah. All right. So, so techni technically, you can uh, make a, uh, a protein molecule or something that is defined as a protein. But um, mm. could they actually replicate any of the uh, protein proteins that we have in our body? Um, um, um I, I think, um, yeah, like I, I think, um, so proteins usually make sort of, well, proteins have a huge amount of um, roles in the body, like I mentioned. Um, so the structural components, they can be used as enzymes, so they can sort of hold components together. 
um, or, you know, like DNA polymerase, I think that's the one that unzips the DNA. Um, yeah. Well, so the, yeah, but, but the, um, the, all right, so, that, that particular protein, DNA polymerase, would they be able to synthesize that in a, uh, uh, in a laboratory? Um, I would imagine so. Really? Okay. Well, because, they, we, be, because sometime because, in the future we'll work out how to do it. <laughs> um, when, when, I, when you say would they be able to synthesize it? Well, because they know they know what they know what all the they know the code behind it. All right. They know the amino acid sequence for it. And so they could actually uh, uh, create a, a polymerized molecule in the lab from scratch. Well. I would imagine they would be able to at least try and string the amino acids together, but I, I would imagine DNA polymerase would be made up of, I would say, um, multi like here, I'd say it would be the quaternion structure. So it'll be probably a, a whole host of complex um, pro, uh, lengths in some sort of an arrangement. That would be my guess. I'm, uh, I don't actually know for sure, but... I would imagine that getting them to fold and do all the right things wouldn't be so easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> that sounds like an understatement. But like I was just wondering, if you actually kind of whacked all the amino acids together and um, formed the, the, the same chemical molecule in terms of the, have, having all the bits and pieces together, would it naturally form that uh, quaternary structure? I don't know. I don't know. I think it. I, I think would, it does. You think it does? I, I think yeah. And the reason is the reason I think that. And don't 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 quote me. But I put a link in the chat earlier regarding protein folding, and there's something called uh, Alpha Fold, which is the same folks that brought you Alpha Go at Google. So what they were able to do was to use enough test cases of knowing what the composition of a protein was. Um, then they could actually then predict the folding, the shape uh, of it uh, um, with a great degree of certainty. And that had never been done before, i.e. to go from the composition to the shape. Uh, and that was last year, I think. So that was a, that was a pretty big step. But, but where does the information come from? Well, the information comes, it's already locked into the DNA structure and it's already yeah. locked into what we're already observing. So one of the big things that hasn't been mentioned here is actually the information uh, and, and the fact that there is so much information, not just complexity, but the complexity comes from the information that's already stored particularly within the DNA. Mm. That, 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 that's why somebody like... Um, uh, uh, what was his uh, name? Uh, just stopped, uh, uh, stepped down from NIH. Uh, Francis Collins. He said that DNA is uh, God's greatest uh, love letter ever. Mm. It's the most information dense substance known to man. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, 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 well, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of, a um, uh, lot more discoveries that, that um, are found within the so-called junk DNA. Hmm. Um, just a question on the Miller-Urey experiment. You said they made 20 amino acids. And uh, um, are they the si uh, um, same amino acids that are um, uh, in used for human life i'm yeah. not too sure i don't know i don't um because only 20 were used uh 20 are required for ours so I, I i don't think they're specific i don't know how many of them were um they could be a separate set of amino acids it could be entirely separate set yeah mm. so they say they, they thought they only found i think about four or six or something like that but then um after i think it was uh, miller died in 2000 i think i think it's in 2007 or something they went through his test equipment and they they discovered that there was actually 23 in there rather than just the five so they had they used sort of more obviously updated 
and mm. tests um what why it why it took them to be rummaging through the test equipment to 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 apply the um uh, the tests sort of 50 55 years later i'm not too sure but anyway yeah pass i i i i seriously doubt that it's the same set Right, okay, because there's 64 possible amino acids, aren't there? 64 possible. Um, I, I said there was about 500 naturally occurring. All right, okay. I, th I thought there was an upper limit on the number of um, uh, amino acids to around about, um, it was two to the eighth for some reason, and uh, but the uh, only, uh, only um, a subset of those are actually used. Um, so, okay, roughly 500 amino acids have been identified in nature. Hmm. Oh, okay, there's a new one on me. Hmm. Um, I think, are you thinking of, are you thinking of the chirality? Are you thinking of the different no. ways? No, so, 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 so if, even if you just had uh, one set, so the uh, left-handed, there's a, a limited number of left handeds and you have a corresponding uh, right handed ones. Um, yeah, but, so uh, no, so of those 500, they um, most of those will be able to be both left and right handed. Yeah. So 20 but, uh, of those, like 19 of those 500 are used in the human body and they come in different isomers. They can be left or right handed. That's still the same amino acid. And you're saying, um, uh, but the the other species have a different set of amino acids. No. What are you other saying? Other species of what, like animals? Yeah. With that, all DNAs that those um, um, uh, are those twenty amino acids, aren't? They? Oh, when I say, um, okay, I'm I'm not too sure. I I, I wouldn't think they're. Um, we need an expert. Yeah, we do need an expert, but... Derek, you're an expert, aren't you? Is he there? He's gone. Right. Our He's afraid you're going to ask him that. <laughs> <Same thing. laughs> yeah. Go, yeah. I'd say I, it's I, probably I... most eukaryote cells rather than just found in the human body. Right, um, okay. Because I thought uh, DNA was composed of uh, that a standard set of... Um, amino acids but mm. pass yeah call a friend yeah yeah isn't an, isn't an expert someone who's 100 kilometers away from his home please explain ah uh, if you live among your own people they know you're a bit false but if you go away you know oh, yeah. people, people believe you whatever all right you say. <laughs> all right mm. okay mm. I know I'm I'm I I'm by no means an expert in this field. I just I just thought it was an interesting topic to discuss, really. So I well, you know enough to go go completely over my head. So oh well, yeah. <laughs> he's not impressed with that one. <laughs> well, that's no great claim. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Uh, yeah, I got to drop off. But thank you very much, Josh. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks yeah, I think, think it, I think at this stage we'll stop the recording and people can just have an open discussion after that. So yeah. uh, I'll just stop the recording now.